Hi, good afternoon to everyone. And first of all, oh, let me uh, activate my webcam so you can see me. Okay. Okay, so good afternoon to everyone. Many thanks to Hanele for the introduction and for inviting me to, to be able to give this uh, presentation and to do this webinar. Uh, as she said, my name is Pedro Espin López and I'm now uh, working, as a, working as an engineer as, and researcher in the CTTC, which is the Technologic Center of Telecommunication uh, from Catalonia in Spain. But uh, the work I'm going to, to present here, it, is, it has been mostly uh, developed um, during my PhD thesis in the University of Pavia in the north of Italy. Um, the title of, the present, of this presentation is going to be Microwave Radars for Estimating Snow Properties, um, Experimental Measurements from the Alps to the Arctic. And I want to um, more or less to create a big picture of the work I have done during my thesis, just uh, without, entering, without um, entering into like big details and focusing more or less in the um, experimental campaigns, especially in uh, the one we did in the, in the Finnish Lapland, which uh, was funded by, fully funded by the Interact programs. I want also thanks uh, to the Interact program and to the, the, uh, to the workers of the station in the of Sodankula FMI Research Center. So, um, under the title of the presentation, you can see the names of, the, of all the people who has given a contribution to this work. So thanks to Marco, Lorenzo, Massimiliano, Fabio, Elena, and Martina. And just say that uh, the main goal of the work I'm going to present here, and also my PhD thesis, was to study the ground-based microwave radar for estimating snow properties and also to propose a prototype and, and be enabled, a prototype who, which can be uh, taken into experimental sites, to the field sites, to real snow fields in order to, uh, to measure snow properties. Um, the name of the project, so you, can, you are going to see it in all the slides, is called Snow Wave, which it's written in the left corner of the slide. And oops, I cannot. Okay. And this is the outline of my presentation. So I will start explaining the motivation of the work. Then I will uh, quickly introduce some things about the theoretical background of the Snow Wave product. Then I will explain the first validation test of this prototype. And then uh, I think it will be the most interesting part of the, of the presentation. I will talk about the experimental results and the experimental campaigns we have done during this work. I will finish with some conclusions. So the big question here, uh, when we speak about the motivation of this work is why uh, do snowpack monitoring? So why is inter why can be, uh, why monitor the snowpack can be interesting for some uh, snow scientists. And I wanted to start just giving the definition uh, that maybe you know of cryosphere, which is the frozen, which can be de defined by the frozen water of this world. In that picture, you can, be, uh, you can see all the elements that uh, can compose the cryosphere. Uh, in order to say that, to address that the snow cover is the largest uh, single component of cryosphere and plays a super important role in climate change because it can act as a regulator of the temperature of the, of the Earth's surface. And this, le this aspect leads to the fact of addressing the, in my, which, which are in my opinion, the three main um, reasons for monitoring the snowpack. These are, uh, as I said, uh, the role of the snow cover as a temperature regulator um, of the Earth's surface, so it is very important for climate change. Um, the second one, which is the, uh, the quality of the uh, snow cover, it, it has a strong economic, can have a, a strong economic impact on winter tur tourism, especially in mountain regions, uh, ski resorts and so on. 
And, and finally, it is also a big supply of fresh water when the snow melts. So it's very important for the reservoir and um, uh, for agricultural purposes, uh, especially. So very quickly in this slide, I wanted to show you some numbers about the, the how can affect winter tourism and to also the human life because uh, the stability of the snowpack, so be, being able to know how the snowpack in a certain region is, uh, if this is stable or not, can create snow avalanches, which uh, in the alpine regions can, in average, uh, produce uh, 100 deaths per year. Uh, that this is the most important fact here in this slide, but it is also important to, to, to address that the structural differences also always in alpine regions can, can be higher than 100 uh, million euros per year. And in a particularly critical year, which was uh, 1999, the damage, the economic impact uh, was 1,000 million euros. So, being able to have to produce reliable uh, information about the snowpack, it is very important. It can be very important for, especially mountain regions. The second uh, main reason for monitoring the snowpack was the freshwater supply. And in this slide, this is very basic the concept of understanding why this is, this is important. But in this slide, that I wanted to introduce you. To, the, to one scientific parameter, which is called the snow water equivalent, which is going to be used in the next slide. It's a very important uh, parameter, and it can be defined as the amount of water contained within the snowpack. This is uh, the amount of water we will, ha we will have when the snow melts in the spring, and it is going to be, uh, it is going to arrive to a reserve if, if it is, uh, driven to a reservoir or maybe to another uh, way to uh, store the water. And we can see in this slide here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, the formula for calculating the snow water equivalent, but it is very simple. It is based only in the snow height and the snow density, uh, which are the, the main parameters, the main parameters here. Um, the third motivation for monitoring the snowpack, it is, as I said, climate change. And I wanted only to show you one, one figure here from the IPCC, uh, just what I think that uh, all of you know that uh, according to the IPCC, there is a very high confidence on the decreasing of the snow cover extent in the Northern hemisphere, especially in the spring. So uh, being able to, to have under control this uh, snow cover extent using different methods, different technologies is very important for the, for the, for the next challenge, challenge we have, which is the climate change. Um, just to finish the introduction, I want to give you some two or three things, two or three ideas about the radars. And just in a very simple way, uh, I can divide the type of radars for observing the Earth uh, parameters in, in these three. You can see in this slide here. And these are space, spaceborne radars, airborne radars, or ground-based based radars based in the, um, in the part of the Earth, we, yeah, more or less in the, in, the technology we, in the technology we are using for observing the Earth. And we have in one hand the spaceborne radar, use it, uh, place it in a satellite which uh, as an advantage, they have a super big observable area, a footprint maybe. And in the other side, we have the ground-based radars, which are the, we have the less observable area. We can maybe observe one slope or maybe one, one square meter of snowpack as we, want, as, as, as we are going to see in the next slides. But we have a very big spatial and, temp and temporal resolution. In the middle, we have airborne radars, which can, which have the advantages of one and the disadvantages of the other one. In this work, we are going to work with ground-based radars because it was the specialty of the laboratory laboratory we have and the um, resources we 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 have. And, and just to say that it is very suitable for observing fast or a small phenomena. 
and it can also help improving the accuracy, the accuracy of satellite-based techniques and overcoming the spatial and temporal limitation that these satellite techniques, techniques they have. Also, it can help reducing the human presence on, the, on this topic of Earth phenomena observation. For example, for studying and for observing the, the properties of the snowpack, nowadays, at least in the Alps, they send uh, uh, at least two persons, which are expert technicians in the field, for uh, digging a snow pit and uh, in a particularly critical slope and obtaining all these parameters such as density, snow water equivalent, liquid water content, and so on. If we are able to produce some technology in order to, I don't know if substitute, but helps reducing the human presence in these critical slopes, I think that uh, brown bears radars can give a super, high, super important contribution. And just in summary, the motivation of this work is to study, as I said, these ground-based methods for monitoring the snowpack using radars and as I said, it can reduce the, it can help reducing the human presence and increasing the spatial and temporal resolution with respect of actual ground-based methods. So I'm going, I, I will try not to be very technical in this part, I, but I wanted on, only to give some two or three concepts of microwave radars. Um, the basic uh, behavior of a radar it consists of uh, transmit a certain electromagnetic wave into the, the air and then being able to uh, detect the echo produced by, that, by a certain target. Um, being able to know the time of flight of this electromagnetic wave between the transmission and the detection, you can estimate directly the distance between the radar and the target. That, this is the, the basic behavior, the most simple way of expressing the behavior of a radar. But what happens when the, the media you have in the middle of uh, the radar and the target, it is not air. And what, happen, it, what happens if this media, it is uh, the properties of this media are not well known as, as happens with snow, which is a very changeable material. So in this case, we are not able anymore to, to estimate directly the distance of the, of the target and, um, be, uh, and why? Because we don't know which is, what is the wave speed, the electromagnetic wave speed in this medium. Because, uh, for example, if we have, talking about the snow, if we have a very low density snow, the, the wave speed will be very close to the air. But if we have a high density snow or even a wet snow, the wave speed will be much more lower. So how to solve this uh, ill pose problem, this uh, non-ability to, to estimate directly the distance? Some uh, words has proposed the use of external aids, external technologies such as GPS uh, uh, receivers, for example, or directly using some estimations about the the, the wave the speed of the different types of the snow of the snow, uh, but I th we think in our laboratory in our uh, research group that these techniques can can give uh, super high um, uh, errors. So our idea as a snow in the snow wave project was to to use a different architecture. Uh, modified architecture of the simple basic rather basic behavior in order to using the same technology rather uh, being able to solve this ill pose problem we try to to solve this problem using a, a dual receiver architecture so using two receivers uh, creating this uh, uh, equations equation system here you can see in the slide but i'm not going to to enter into details and taking um, using the, the the electric properties models of the snow that uh, are in the literature for example we can see here in this slide the the, the electric properties properties model for dry snow created by Halle Kainen in uh, 1986 we can directly estimate the uh, 
these snow parameters such as density, snow water equivalent, snow high, or liquid water content for the wet snow case. So that's the, the equation of this presentation. And well, once we have, um, we have the idea of the radar we want to, to, to create, uh, we have um, proposed a prototype, which I'm going to, to show you in the next slide. And the first step was to, to, to do some validation tests in a controlled environment in order to, to see if our idea can work. So this is, uh, I want to, to skip this slide uh, quickly. It's like the first, first, first step create when we create a prototype like this, it was like um, um, trying to simulate the whole system. We can see the simulation here in the left down corner. Uh, try to simulate in a specific software, in a computer, all the system in a super controlled environment uh, in order to test that the, the errors if can be satisfactory for us and they were lower than 12% for the dielectric constant, which is related with the density and lower than 4% for the snow depth. Then the next step was to, to build a prototype. We can see here a very, very, very simple prototype, which was composed of a VNA, a vector network analyzer, that uh, it's, um, uh, it's the, uh, the device who, which creates the electromagnetic waves somehow and send it to the antenna in order to be transmitted into the, the air in this case or the snow in the, in the case of the, in the real field uh, and also to receive it and process it. And we have tried in this indoor validation to obtain the, the depth, <laughs> even if it's not the depth, it's the distance, of the um, of this space here we can see in the picture and the density of the air is kind of nonsense but as a as a first validation prototype it worked and next when we have validated our, our system our tested our system in a laboratory controlled laboratory environment we have gone to the real field and close to our um, university in the north of Italy, we have uh, a collaboration with the Valle d'Aosta region, which is a region in the northwest of Italy. Uh, and it's the region uh, with the Italian part of the Mont Blanc, for example, and the Italian part of the Matterhorn or the Cervino. And we, they provide us with, uh, I think, three sites, yes. It's three sites, Chanel, Cime Bianche, and Pila, with different test field, uh, in order to test our device. So the first one was in Pila ski area. It was placed at an altitude of 2,500 meters above sea level, uh, oriented north, and the validation tests were done during February, April 2017 and 2018, in two different places called Chamole and Golf, the second one was in Cime Bianche, close to the village of Cervinia, at an altitude of 3,000 meters above sea level, oriented north, even if it's super flat, uh, during April of 2018. And the third one was focused more in wet snow and close to the village of Chenail, placed at an altitude of 2,100 meters above sea level. It was an open site during May of 2019. So uh, this, uh, in this slide, I wanted to show you the prototype we carry during this uh, uh, outdoor validation. It was composed of three antennas, one transmitter and two receivers. Uh, this wooden dedicated support in order to uh, be able to change and test different positions from the different receivers. Uh, uh, the key side field fox, it's the vector network analyzer that I have explained a couple of slides uh, before. And in this uh, outdoor validation, we, we introduced a new thing, which was a Raspberry, a Raspberry Pi based computer. And with the function of process all the radar, radar data and to, to show the graphs and the results to the user. 
And in the case of Chenail, of the last uh, test site, which was intended to be the test site for wet snow, we, we use in collaboration with the FMI, the Finnish Meteorolo Meteorological Institute, the, they borrow us the Finnish snow fork, a well-known instrument to obtain the liquid water content of the, of the snow pack, and, and we use it to validate our system. We, have, we can see here the, the Finnish snow fork uh, measurement in Chenail, which is just the liquid water content alongside the, the whole snowpack. And I wanted to show you, I want to show you only the, the results for, of the, for the outdoor validation. We can see um, in the left part of the slide the result for, for dry snow. And okay, they are satisfactory, they are lower than 30%, so they are good for us. And in the right part of the of the slide, the results for wet snow. They are, they are the errors or the accuracy is a little bit lower, um, so the errors are higher. Uh, but uh, the wet case is always more challenging, and we were also happy with the results. So these results are, uh, let us um, pass to the next step, which were like test uh, massively or somehow massively our system in the field in a longer campaigns. And these longer campaigns were basically three. I debate, it was 42 measurements, uh, to be honest, divided in three data sets and uh, made in two different places. The first place was Pila Golf. I have talked about Pila, this, the, the first key resort I, I show you previously. And during February of 2019, it, uh, it took us five days with five measurements, averaging six measurements each time. And the second place were in, in the TA, TA station, in TA Interact station of Solancula uh, during March of 2019. Uh, it took long 24 days and we did in one, um, uh, in one of the data sets, 28 measurements, and in the other one, nine. So just to talk a little bit about the Solancula test field, uh, it is placed in the Finnish Lapland. It is 100 kilometers north of the polar Arctic Circle. Mostly uh, we had the uh, dry conditions of the snow, and uh, it is the flat terrain. Uh, all the experiments, all the, the experimental campaign was developed close to the facilities of the Finnish Meteorological Institute at an altitude of 179 uh, meters above sea level. And this campaign was part of the Snow Up project, which was intended to be, uh, to gather a lot of uh, technologies from the microwave to the optic uh, um, part of the spectrum in order to understand the, the behavior of the snow uh, the interaction become between the snow and these uh, electromagnetic fields. Um, in order not to, to show you a lot of figures here, a lot of course and results, I, will, I wanted to show you only this one, which is a summary of all the experimental results of the three data sets. Uh, the dots are the BC1 data set, triangle C21, and crosses C22 for the snow high in the uh, up right corner of the figure and the snow water equivalent in the uh, left down part of the figure and the root mean square error in this table here. Um, the results were very, very satisfactory for us, uh, except maybe we can see there is not much correlation in the crosses for the snow water equivalent. So the C22, um, uh, data set and our theory is there is not much correlation because in the in this data set we used a different instrument for obtaining the the, the manual density of the snowpack and uh, well I, I, we assume that it is not good enough for it's not precise enough for being uh, compared with our system but it's a theory and well Another thing we, we did during this campaign in, in Solancula was uh, a very interesting thing, that, which is the potential of our architecture and of our methodology for calculating and for in, obtaining the internal snow layers of the snowpack. 
this is a very challenging thing in our opinion because the density jumps between um, layers inside the the snowpack uh, are very uh, are not super high so it is difficult for the radar to detect it but uh, we can see here in the left part of the slide some simulated ha uh, cases which prove that uh, the idea can be applied can be can be can be done and at the right part of the of the slide we can see a real case in Solancula where we try to to do a sort of a stratigraphy in terms of density of a dry snow of a dry snowpack and in the dust uh, line we can see the the estimation of our radar and in the continuous line we can see the the manual measurement done by a technician um, there is a lot of room for improvement here but i think we are optimists that if reducing the uncertainties of our methodology uh, our radar can can be able to to produce some kind of a stratigraphy in terms of density and this is this could be very interesting for the for obtaining the stability of a snowpack the last technical part it's just uh, a new approach we we apply to the data sets which were reducing the the antennas to from three to two uh, in order to use only one transmitter and one receiver uh, and taking the advantage of the double bands of the electromagnetic wave you can see it here the the, the in this picture the the path of the electromagnetic wave we can somehow solve the ill post problem and to resolve the equation uh, system we have seen uh, before and uh, just very 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 quickly show you the results they are i think very very good and uh, maybe we are underestimating the snow height uh, we can see here that yeah maybe our 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 estimation of the snow height is a little bit lower but uh, it is uh, as a potential technique for, for calculating in a very fast and simple way the snow water equivalent and the snow height, we, we, we are very happy with that. And well, last, I wanted to show you some, some videos and some photos of, the, of our experimental campaigns. And the, these ones are from Valle d'Aosta in Italy, from Pila. And we can see here, yes how do we do our measurements and this is the first prototype only with two antennas and we were moving the second one in order to create a fake, yeah, fake second receiver and well the procedure here was going to the field and do our radar measurements just as we can see in this video and then just the physical part of the field work, just to dig uh, a pit in the place where we have done our measurements. And these two women here, uh, yep, which are the, the, the expert on snow from the Valle d'Aosta region, uh, start to study and analyze the physical properties of the snowpack. Okay, oops. These are some photos from the Sardinia field work. Uh, maybe if you like mountains, you can uh, know which mountain is this one. It's, it's the, the Cervino in, in German, the Matterhorn, but this is the Italian side, not, maybe not so famous, but very beautiful indeed. And this, in this picture in the right, we can see the, the height, the snow height we can have in the Italian Alps, which is much more higher than, than the usual snow height we have in the Arctic uh, zones. These uh, photos are from Chenel. We can see a much more shallow snowpack because we were in late spring and with the wet snow, which tends to, to be much more shallow. And in the left uh, picture, just to show you that the first, first, very first step of the field work was to go in around with the skis, with the ski touring skis, in order to, 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 to detect the best area for doing our, our experience. Okay. Um, lastly, I will finish showing you some photos from the Inter Interact uh, funded campaign, which were in Salancola. 
and this is the uh, the measure measurements side from of the FMI in Solancola. It's super 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 nice. We were um, a lot of different scientists here doing our experiment. Each one of us uh, with its own portion of land of snow in order to 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 do their own experiments. And maybe the the important thing here is here we can see the snow pit. This is the this is crucial for all the experiments because it's going to be the uh the place where the manual measurements the, the all the the proper the physical properties of the snow of the snowpack are taken in order to be compared with our systems and this is is going to to be growing day by day until creating destroying all this this snow field this is the in the in the photo of the right we can see the the snowpack the snow pit sorry and well, how in the Lapland the snow snow cover can be very 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 flat. And the left part we can see the yeah, frozen river, which is very beautiful in my opinion, and also the sunsets of of Solangola. And as a conclusion, just to to tell you that uh, we have presented in in this work a novel radar architecture for snowpack monitoring, experimental results uh, in real condition during field test has presented low errors for the master parameters, both for dry and wet snow, and also to address the potential of this architecture and this technique for retrieving the internal structure of the snowpack, which I think is going to be very interesting. And uh, well, just to say that field work, field work can be very fun sometimes. Uh, well, thanks to, to everyone.